So time is short. We are a bit uh, late. So let's make the best uh, of our time. Uh, first of all, welcome all of you. Uh, I'm Stefano Bisoffi. I'm the moderator of this session. Uh, I am the scientific director of the CRA, Agricultural Research Council, which is the main research organization entirely devoted to agriculture operating in Italy. My background is in forestry, forest genetics to be precise, but now I have taken up more of a research coordinating, a research policy uh, job. I am also involved, we have heard a lot of the SCAR. I'm involved in the SCAR working group, and now I'm a member of the SCAR foresight group, the uh, group that oversees the foresight exercise. I don't want to sp spend more on uh, my background or my uh, past experience. I just want to set briefly the scene for this uh, round table. Um, we have uh, discussed about the bioeconomy. Actually, the, this is the third conference uh, dedicated to the bioeconomy at the European level. Um, uh, bioeconomy is still a, a rather fuzzy concept, uh, uh, which means probably different things to different uh, uh, groups. Uh, but it's certainly here to stay. It's uh, one, it's a great opportunity for the future. Um, the European Union has a strategy already since 2012, and uh, as we have heard, several countries, not all, not Italy, have uh, a strat devo developed a bioeconomy strategy of their own. This conference is dedicated to, uh, let's say, to passing from concepts to actions. So to uh, um, finding what are the enabling conditions and the uh, success factors that may the bioeconomy uh, uh, pass from an idea to an opportunity. We've heard very fascinating ideas, especially I found, uh, and as probably all of you, the uh, presentation by Günther Pauli really inspiring. I just wondered what, what would the rest of the conference speak about after that presentation. But uh, in this specifically, this uh, set of parallel sessions deals with the capitals, the financial capital, how to mobilize the capitals it, uh, for the development of the bioeconomy. So the financial capital, the social capital, the human capital, and in this case, this uh, conference, which I consider the most strategic one, deals with the biological capital. If the bioeconomy is uh, uh, based on the use of biological resources, then the biological capital is the key of all. So um, the, we um, already know that uh, the uh, bioeconomy can do a lot to a more sustainable use of biological resources, can do a lot of good to the environment, to climate, for instance, by substituting uh, fossil fuels for production of energy or bioplastics or materials or anything like that. Uh, we also know that uh, it makes good for the environment by reducing waste, recycling waste, make better use of, uh, uh, let's say, leftovers or byproducts of the uh, industrial processing. Uh, but that's not all. Uh, the main question that uh, will be uh, the object of this um, roundtable will be how can we uh, protect the capital? If we leave off a capital like the biological resources, we must protect it and we should leave off the interest, probably improving the capital itself. So uh, there are, of course, many challenges, many unsolved questions, but I would say that the main point that uh, the, the panel would discuss is 
what are the suggestions or the opportunities or the way forward or the actions to be taken in order to uh, make the best uh, of this biological capital. We, we have uh, with us three uh, distinguished uh, speakers in our panel. I will uh, uh, present them in the order of their uh, speaking. So uh, on my right, I have uh, Mauricio Bellon, who is principal scientist in conservation and availability uh, program at the Bioversity International, which is, uh, as most of you know, the international organization uh, devoted to the uh, protection and preservation of the and knowledge and exploitation of the sustainable exploitation of biological diversity. He uh, has a, a PhD in, uh, in ecology at the University of California, Davis, and has previous experience uh, in two other very uh, famous research institutions, so the CGIR, that is to say the CIMIT in Mexico and the uh, IRI, International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines. Uh, so a very good background to speak about uh, biological resources. Uh, on my right, uh, Bettina Hyman. Uh, she has a doctorate, a PhD in population genetics in Göttingen University in Germany, but uh, uh, for the, she made uh, most of the research work of her, her PhD in the UK, in Rothamsted, and uh, in France, University of Dijon. So she has quite an international experience as well. She is now a research policy advisor with the univers at the University of Aarhus in Denmark, and she is also the Secretary General of Euragri, which is uh, the European Research Agricultural Research Initiative, a sort of think tank grouping together uh, funding agencies, performing agency in the field of agricultural research. Uh, Martin Scholten from the uh, Netherlands, uh, Wageningen University and Research. He is the uh, director and founder of uh, IMARES, which is the Integrated Marine Research Institute of the Wageningen University and Research. He has a PhD in uh, biology at the uh, University of uh, um, uh, Amsterdam. And uh, he has also been the uh, president of the uh, FRO, which is the European Association of Fisheries and Aquaculture Research Organization. And she is, he is now leading one of the uh, sections the section on aquaculture. And he is also co-chairman of the Global Research Alliance, so that research initiative devoted to uh, agricultural greenhouse gases, and the chairman, the, the leader of the Animal Task Force of the Global Research Alliance. So uh, I uh, do not want to forget uh, Mario Bonacorso, who is a journalist, who will be the rapporteur for our session. I thank him very much for his availability to do this, this job. So um, I, I would suggest that we have uh, short presentations, short uh, uh, discussion by each of the three panelists. Then we uh, would open the floor, uh, the, um, yeah, the floor to questions from the audience uh, or comments. And then we shall end up with a short remarks and short uh, um, replies by the panel again. So let's start with uh, Mauricio Bellon. Yes, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And following your instructions, I'm just have a, I'm gonna raise just a few points. Uh, let me just say that I work for an institution, the Biodiversity International, which is, is uh, which basically is is about is an organization that looks at the conservation and use of uh, what we call agricultural biodiversity, and it, we, what we mean by that is the biodiversity that is relevant for food and agriculture, for food and agriculture, and although that's the, the, the biodiversity that is relevant is very large, so but we specifically work mostly on plant. Uh, on plants, domesticated plants, and including both uh, crops and trees. 
So that, that will give you a background of what, and both looking at the diversity of species that are relevant to plant and, and forestry species that are relevant to for food and agriculture, but as well as the interspecific inter diversity, that the genetic diversity, and that's historically what we have been focusing more. The reason I'm giving you this background because my talk would, would basically uh, talk about the, these issues, the issues of the diversity of species uh, that we manage and how we can get more benefits from it. And I'm gonna start talking about, uh, uh, we now talked a lot uh, about uh, ecosystem services, and obviously we talk about a bioeconomy. There is a big part of, of thinking about how can we use those ecosystem services in a more efficient way and, and, and try to replace what we have done in the past of using external inputs and use more of these, uh, these ecosystem services. But I want to introduce a topic and a theme that is very important, I think, but we have not recognized it, and that, that is evolutionary biological services, uh, process, evolutionary services. And by that, I mean, we mean, or I mean uh, that... Um, you know, the, those are all the, the benefits and uses that humanity or society derives from the process of biological evolution. And, and so we are, and clearly we, there are many, and we, we, we obviously, the agriculture that we, we work in, in many, in, in many areas, we, uh, we are obviously derive many benefits and many services and disservices also from, from the evolutionary processes, but sometimes we don't recognize that. And that sometimes gets us in a lot of trouble. Um, so we, we have, to, obviously, the, the history of humanity is about trying to control and steer evolutions in ways that are useful for, for human beings. But in doing so, so, so we create problems by that. And in, specifically in the case of, of agriculture and food systems, is the result of this, uh, of our capacity to influence and, and control these processes. But these processes don't stop. Sometimes we, we think that, you know, now we can control all these processes and now we can create uh, genetically modified organisms, etc. And this is a big topic, but, but you know, the, the process doesn't stop. And I think that it's very important to understand that this is, and that, that we, in fact, we do need to maintain, and that the evolutionary processes in agriculture are based in, on crop biodiversity. Uh, and therefore, maintain, in maintaining crop evolution in farms, which is the historical, it was what historically has happened in, in, in farms and in landscapes, is important and will continue to be important. That, and it's not enough just to have all these uh, genes in banks, which is also a very important thing. But we also need to recognize that we need to maintain many of these processes going, continue to going in the field. And, and why is it so important? I mean, you, you might ask. Uh, and, and that's because by doing so, by doing, it's, it's like having lottery tickets. Is by maintaining uh, this process of evolution under many different environments by many different people in ways we, we cannot predict. We are basically creating genetic variation that can be useful in the future in which we cannot predict. So that is, and so this is the idea of, of basically maintaining lottery tickets. But however, and this is one of the great challenges, increase homogenization and simplification of agriculture and linking these historical processes of coevolution between crops and, farming, and, and farmers in farming systems, uh, while very important, and, and there's, there's no denying of that, and providing short-term benefits threaten the provision of these evolutionary services for the future. And, and the most important part is that this can increase vulnerability to unpredictable change. Now we talk a lot about uh, climate change. So how are we going to face unpredictable change depends very much on having different options. And so therefore the, the diversity, uh, the diversity at different levels, but particularly a genetic diversity. So clearly a, a, a bioeconomic approach, and again, it can be seen many different ways, but the way I understand it, the two agriculture and food systems should explicitly and systematically recognize the importance of evolutionary services. Uh, and clearly, as, as external inputs uh, who have been are substitutes of ecosystems and evolutionary processes, for example, fertilizers for nutrient cycling, herbicides for plant, plant capacity to compete with, her, with other plant species, pesticides to plant, uh, to, for, uh, uh, for uh, resist the, the capacity of plants to resist pests. If we are going to move into a bioeconomic model where we, we, use, we are going to replace that by more use of bio, biological processes, we need to understand and use more explicitly these evolutionary processes. 
and in the, all the entities that, that we're. So the new paths of development that rely less on non-renewable resources uh, will have to uh, accept and in fact build on more diversity, heterogeneity, and relying more on, on these services. And therefore, it's, very, it's important to, de to develop an understanding and ma managing better these evolutionary services and the services. This is not to advocate uh, going back to uh, an idealized low productivity agriculture of the past of relying in local varieties, although that has, but, but uh, it's, it's about combining an intensive agriculture that builds on ecosystems and evolutionary services, as well as also recognizing the value of low intensive agriculture to the extent that it provides many of these inputs. And so the, trying to find forms in which high intensity and low intensive agriculture can coexist, I think is an important component of, of how, and, but how to do that is, is clearly challenging uh, because we need to have uh, mechanisms that would, that would allow uh, for these systems to coexist and to mutually to have synergies among them. And these institutional me mechanisms uh, sometimes will rely, you know, obviously the ideal world would be that markets can deal with them, but clearly markets up to now have not been able to, to maintain this. So clearly there, there is, and, and also a very important thing is the link not only between low intensive and high intensive agriculture, but between the north and the south, because in the, north, in the south, what we call the south, is where many of these evolutionary processes still continue. And then the, the so, then the, one of the very important points is how that we can uh, have this, this, create these mechanisms which, in which these two, syst uh, these two systems and these two areas can benefit each other and can coexist. And so that we can maintain crop evolution in fields today that enables humanity to continue to have the broad genetic variation needed to adapt to cross to crops, to changes tomorrow, which is at the heart of uh, having a resilient food and agric agricultural and food systems. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mauricio. Yeah. A little bit fast, I don't know, but uh, I know that you want it short. Uh, the, uh, thank you very much also for keeping in the <laughs> allotted time, which is, time is precious in these days. And, and thank you for opening a, a window on the uh, need for the preservation of uh, diversity and uh, future options also for the evolutionary processes, which is a key factor for uh, sustainable development. Uh, mm -hmm of biological resources. Um, I now ask uh, Bettina to uh, make a speech. Uh, yeah. yes, um, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I actually would more or less like to continue where my previous speaker stops. Um, I would generally say also from what we've heard this morning, um, diversity sort of is fostered and created by diversity. So when uh, like 10, 15, 10,000, uh, no, um, no, when the first human started sort of seeding and harvesting plants and maintaining animals um, to augment the food um, they obtained from wild uh, growing plants, that resulted actually in agricultural terms in a lot of variety because the seed varieties when they started spreading and the animal breeds and so on spreading to local conditions. Um, you had this, what was also mentioned before, you, you started to create this, um, this many vari uh, these varieties adapted from which you could sort of, which you could use for breeding uh, purposes again. Um, the other thing also that you have a lot of co-evolving variety in terms of um, soil fauna, weeds, pests, and predators. And um, so there's a lot of variety to work with and to work on and to adapt to. But another very important point I would like to make is that it's not only on single species or on genomes and, and so on where we have uh, variety. We're talking also um, about variety in plant communities, habitats, and landscapes. And there, this is also very, very important with regard to um, commercializing on um, biodiversity. And also, in, in a way, I found that a little bit striking that only this sort of this sort of starting agriculture and so on, it, having a surplus of food production, so it wasn't just entirely subsistence food production. We actually had the the, the overflow and, and the, the possibility to create the very diverse uh, societies we are living on today, which we were able to 
to um, or humanity was able to have um, villages and um, arts and all the rest of it because there was a um, specialization of labor. So now, um, but um, now in the at least in the last century, with all the um, the industrialization of agriculture, what happened? We have we actually had with industrialization of agriculture, we had a sort of a very reduction of biodiversity because we have these commercial crop varieties and animal breeds and the resulting tendency to genetic and ec ecological uniform uniformity, which also actually is very much reflected on landscape levels. So it's not only plants again, it is also landscapes with all the negative um, in terms of eco uh, ecological services and so on, with all the negative con uh, consequences. And of course, as we all are very much aware of, we had a general uh, fall in biodiversity, quite a severe, uh, severe one, and it actually continues to do so. So what does it mean for bioeconomy? And that is a big, um, a big challenge if you want to discuss here. And with regard to the so-called craze for maize, with bioethanol and um, in, in the US, for example, and also in Germany with um, the biogas production, which was also politically stimulated very much. It doesn't look so good. But as we also heard very much today, there are also other examples. And I actually like to focus on one of these where actually biodiversity can add to um, um, to, to business model, but it's still very much uh, in research. And this is um, actually a research project going on in Aarhus University at the university where the EU Agri Secretariat is located. And um, actually, I quite liked it was a mention from the lady from Sardinia um, who talked earlier this morning. Um, and I think that was very much also the idea there, L not look so much at the potential from a technology, but also from an area perspective. And that is what actually done, because the first question we asked us was, I mean, how can we actually um, increase biomass production in a country like Denmark, far north? I mean, the climate change, one could say, is um, working at least uh, right now for us and not against us. But still, and then one thing was, in a sense, this wheat or cereal production, summer cereal production and so on, is not really particularly good in terms of um, exploitation of sunlight, for example, because it uses a very, very short um, growing season. It is harvested in summer when uh, mainly there's still a lot of, um, um, yeah, um, when there's still, there would be much more potential also during late summer and autumn in terms of um, uh, radiation. So we talked about grasslands. Grassland disappears because um, with also in Denmark with a highly industrialized um, um, agriculture. I mean, pigs have never been out of the stable, or very few of them are, but also um, dairy cows are increasingly held entirely in, in, in stables and so on, or in sheds. Um, but then actually the bioeconomy could, um, could help. So what to do with the grassland? There would be another um, uh, an, another um, uh, what is it? Another win situation by uh, benefit by um, because in Denmark water tables are very uh, ground water tables are very high. So you have a lot of uh, and that is again is a, prob a problem with wheat production. You have a big problem with nitrogen and the nitrogen legislation in Denmark reflects it. Um, uh, Danish farmers are not allowed to use very much nitrogen, much less than in other countries, uh, with the consequence that the wheat quality actually isn't particularly good. It's uh, for baking reasons, uh, to bake bread, for example, wheat has to be imported from, from France and so on, where the, the protein content, so that the protein content is much higher. So it was using, and that is the, the, the research project, using more grassland together with legume, uh, legumes, sort of to be able to then extract protein from it, which then can be used for feed. Denmark has an incredible pig production, so um, that could then also um, lower the um, 
imports of protein in form of soya and so on from Brazil, for example, and would help there again sort of in terms of um, ecological footprint. And uh, the rest could go into uh, a biorefining to do, and that is a particular uh, Danish version here that um, we want um, um, a hydro, I can't actually, I can never quite, a hydrothermal conversion um, into actual biofuel. And that all is supposed to be accompanied by social economical um, assessment sort of in terms of footprint and feasibility and markets and so on. But I think this is an example. I mean, technology is still very much the limit here, but it's an example where one could actually, by increasing biodiversity, using more plants, have different crop protections. Also, with it, we'll, we it will actually have more diverse landscapes again and not just um, cereal, cereals and um, maize in between that could increase biodiversity. It won't completely get us back to where we started, as where we were 100 years ago, but it is, could be one example of, um, of increasing and um, commercializing biodiversity. Thank you, Bettina. Uh, also for bringing to our attention the need to pay attention to the landscape and not mm -hmm. to the single crops. Uh, I think that the different dimensions of diversity must be always kept in mind. We are talking about diversity of genes, of genomes, of species, but also of landscapes. And uh, also for pointing out that the uh, the increase of biodiversity just by changing a crop from a, a monoculture to a, a forage to pasture to forage crops which are based on a mixture of different uh, species that can do good for the environment and probably also do for the uh, um, for the other types of industries especially for animal husbandry, animal, livestock industry. So we are, uh, we, we would now move from the earth to the uh, water and uh, we are, uh, I leave the floor to Martin Scholten. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a couple of slides, but don't worry, there is no text in it, there's only pictures. Uh, and I have, uh, have a short note for, uh, for you, but uh, yeah, observing this morning, I have one big observation, and that is the marine economy is not yet connected to the bioeconomy uh, community. It's a strong community, but I hardly see anybody from the marine economy. Uh, so I think it's, it, it, I have a message for you here. It's a grand challenge to use the biomass that's available around the globe. Uh, that was the message this morning. Uh, it's a grand challenge to do that on a sustainable and a very smart way. That is the subject of this session. Biomass comes from biota. Biota are biodiversity, and we have to protect biodiversity because ecosystem planet Earth is based on biodiversity, on biomass. So how can we sustain a bio-based economy for 9 billion people within the carrying capacity of planet Earth? And can we do that with one-third of the Earth, the solid grounds, or can we also use the other two-third part of the, the world, the oceans and, and the waters that are there? Let me first tell you something about the bio, marine biodiversity. 70% uh, of the world's surface is, uh, is, is, is sea but uh, only 4% uh, of the uh, uh, world biodiversity is in the sea. But 4% biodiversity in the sea is highly recognized and highly acknowledged by public. I call it always the Jacques Cousteau effect. And we know all the movies about sea life and how uh, a great sea life is. When we speak about biomass available in, in the world, it's, it's 560 billion tons of, of carbon that's available, and only 5 of 10% of that biomass is at sea. 
But there is a big difference. In land, it's almost all plant biomass, and only 90-90% is plant biomass, phytobiomass, and the animals are only consuming less than 20% of the phytobiomass to produce uh, animal biomass. You see, that's the other way around. Um, most of the, uh, the biomass in the sea is uh, animal biomass. And almost all the plant biomass is eaten by animals. And that's the reason why there is so less animal biomass, uh, pl plant biomass in the sea. It's a strong conversion of plant biomass into animal biomass. When we think about the challenge for the world and when we think about food security, uh, it's, it's, it's mainly also about how can we supply enough uh, uh, animal proteins to the people. And uh, yeah, there is an understanding that more and more seafood originated animal proteins might become uh, needed, might become relevant for the human consumption. Um, we, we speak about, we expect a blue revolution when it comes to agro-food production. Uh, is it agro-food? It's blue uh, uh, revolution. But it doesn't come from fisheries. It has to come from aquaculture, we think. But I'll come to that uh, uh, later. Um, although two-thirds of the world is sea, only 70% of the animal proteins comes from sea at the moment. And it is already twice as much as a couple of years ago. And uh, it's, it's, it's estimated that, that much more is needed. But there is not only food in the sea. What to think about seaweeds and high energy value they have, but probably even more important, the high fine chemical content the seaweeds have. What to think about marine invertebrates, which are very active with metabolites, which are very of, of high interest for the pharmaceutical industry, for instance. There is much beyond the, uh, the benefits of uh, the marine biomass. The World Bank and the FAO estimated that we need uh, 190 million uh, tons of uh, seafood to feed the world uh, in 2030. And uh, the, the fisheries, the, the amount that comes from fisheries is stagnating. The amount that comes from aquaculture is increasing. But that's not without, uh, without risk. And uh, I, I, as, as a marine ecologist, I cannot believe that this, this is the, the, the summit. It, it, it's more an indication that the fisheries, the way how we do it, that aquaculture, the way how we do it, is not the right way to really uh, yield the potential of production of the marine uh, environment. We have a very selective fish fisheries, which is fishing down the food chain and, and not fishing with the food chain. The commissioner this morning uh, gave an, a good example of fishing with the food chain. If there are a lot of jellyfish, why not, uh, why not go for the jellyfish? Uh, why do we... Uh, the, the, the problems are because we are very selective and we're very focused on, uh, on the top predators and, and only part of the fish. That was what uh, um, uh, Mr. Uh, Gaudi, uh, Ka Pauli sorry, uh, said. Yeah, there are two Paulis in the world. Huh? <laughs> Daniel Pauli. And, um, and when it comes to the aquaculture, it, it, it is it is very concentrated, intensive at, at certain locations, which, which means a hotspot uh, in emissions to the environment. And, and also that is, 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 is concerning. Um, so what is then the way out? Well, in land-based agriculture, we, we're using yield cap analysis to see what can be uh, done in managing the natural processes uh, to uh, optimize uh, uh, the yield. And of course, sometimes that's unsustainable, but more and more we realize that with yield cap analysis, we can improve uh, production uh, on the basis of natural processes. 
And I'm a strong believer that that can be done in, at sea as well. The marine productivity is so high that with a smart yield cap analysis and the management of the marine productivity based on this yield cap analysis, you can uh, uh, you, you can really come up with with higher yield without uh, uh, destroying uh, the marine life. This is an example for uh, uh, for for the uh, traditional aqua culture. But we heard this morning about the idea of uh, fishing without nets, and, and uh, then I don't mean the, the, the things that happens in the in the in the African Horn, but the fishing without nets. I I want to say I want to add to that also uh, farming without nets, really using the potential of the marine productivity in managing the seas in such a way that. We foster natural processes so that we can uh, harvest from this, uh, uh, this, uh, this yield. Uh, harvesting in a, in a passive way, harvesting in a smart, multitrophic way, harvesting uh, on, on a really ecosystem-based approach, a really ecosystem-based uh, approach. Um, Exploring the potential of nature, the biodiversity to improve the quality of life, the bio-based e economy. I'm a believer that we can link those two up also in the marine environment. If we use the full genomics, if we use alternative nut nutritive feed sources, if we use the natural dynamics at sea, working with nature, that is what, uh, what I would like uh, uh, to see. Consider also the carbon sequestration potential if you really uh, promote uh, 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 biomass production at, at, at spots at the sea that, that you can do. Uh, and uh, you can uh, uh, recover the, the, the carbon. But sea is not land. Uh, we have to consider the differences. Uh, of course, the principle of the mare librem. Uh, the, the common goods versus uh, the land ownership at land, uh, the fluid uh, the dispersive versus the locally confined environmental conditions on land, and uh, the related high awareness of the protection of the ocean's uh, resources and marine life. We have to consider that, uh, that in this, uh, this way. I think that uh, ocean farming based on ecosystem-based marine biomass productivity management, it's a full uh, uh, word, but, but, but that's what I mean. Uh, the, the management of the productivity of the sea so that, that we can harvest biomass, more biomass than we do now, without all the threats that we see now from fisheries and, uh, and, and uh, aquaculture, it, it requires a breakthrough in the political perception of harvesting seafood uh, and other bi biomass, the public perception, but also requires new governance models for global ocean management, and mind shift in the maritime actors, uh, fish, uh, to, to, to produce the fish in another way. And yeah, my recommendation is to come in some way or the other to a kind of round table for sustainable marine biomass production to develop and implement a proposed conceptual framework for marine productivity management with multi-actors from agro-food, maritime economy and the maritime uh, uh, and the marine biodiversity perspectives. Uh, and as uh, Commissioner uh, Quinn this morning said, in a regional, uh, uh, in, in a regional action uh, with demonstration farms, uh, uh, so that we really uh, uh, favor uh, or that we really let flourish the, the diversity that uh, that we have in Europe, also in our European seas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, I think that uh, you complemented what uh, Gunther Pauli said this morning, that probably there is a lot of potential in the marine uh, area and uh, the, the condition for exploiting that uh, bonanza would probably come from only from a better understanding of the ecosystems of the biology uh, and the if we are able to improve the ecosystems probably we are able not, not only to recover the fish stocks 
that were uh, once available, but also to uh, improve them to a higher level. And so the opportunities for the future will depend on how we are able to preserve the, and probably improve the, possibly improve the ecosystems. At, at sea, probably because uh, in, in the first instance, because we know uh, much less than on the, on the land, but also uh, on, on the on land at farm scale or uh, landscape uh, scale. Uh, I would now open the, the floor to uh, questions, comments. Uh, may I ask you to, uh, first of all, to wait for the micro, because we are in streaming, otherwise the, the, your voice will never reach uh, the people. Secondly, to just uh, say who you are, your affiliation, your country of origin, just that. And please be short in your questions and comments, so to leave floor to the rest of the audience. Thank you. Please. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Mastorf and I'm coming from the Danish Agriculture and uh, Food Council. Um, I basically have two questions and uh, I mean, I think we all agree on, on the vision of from this session. Um, but on the other hand, I feel like at least with the two first speakers that we are a little bit sitting in an island and not really realizing what kind of world we are living in. Because we, an evolutionary approach, it sounds nice, I like it. And organic farming is a little bit uh, in that understanding. However, what's the business case? I mean, it's not every consumer who wants to buy organic food or organic products or products that are developed through an evolutionary process. Secondly, uh, in 2050, we'll be more than uh, 9 billion people on this earth. Uh, we need to produce at least 60% uh, more food at that time. Uh, how does it fit into the evolutionary and and uh, sort of uh, slow food process that you are presenting? And then finally, just a comment on the nitrogen. I think that's a very complex issue, and I think one shouldn't come out with so sort of drastic uh, uh, conclusions and uh, definitions on what the problem is and uh, and how it should be solved. There are many projects on the way and. Uh, so I think that should be taken into, into account. Thank you. Yes, please. Christina Varese from the University of Turin, also on behalf of uh, Microbial Research, uh, Research Infrastructure. So my question, again, are two. For sure, for microorganisms, we still have to explore most of the biodiversity and we have to preserve them. So this is a very important point uh, for me. And the second is, if possible, a comment on the new EU legislation on access and benefit sharing of genetical resources and Nagoya Protocol. Thank you. Well, um, uh, my name is Michael Carlos from Germany, Nova Institute. Uh, I have two comments. The one is on grassland. Uh, so I agree to your opinion, but the problem is in reality on our planet, it's the other way around. And we see to uh, South America or Africa or other regions there yeah, turning grassland in agriculture uh, land. So it would be nice to first to stop this process. Uh, um, and the other comment is um, to you if you say we need at least 60% uh, more biomass in 2050. Um, we, we, we just made uh, big analysis on that and I think it's not easy to, to tell so those numbers. It could also be much less. Um, for example, we would have less meat consumption if we would uh, have uh, less food losses, today we have about 30% losses, so when we can reduce them to 15%, then the question is what happens with biofuels and bioenergy? We will have very, uh, um, very um, low priced solar um, energy. We have a CO2 economy to utilize CO2. So if you look to all the different trends which are coming, uh, I think it, uh, it could also be less than 60%. Uh, we should not uh, make it so easy with such a number, I think. Uh, 
Thank you. Uh, Jacques Fuchs from DG Research at the Marine Unit. A uh, question for my colleague from uh, the ocean. Uh, Martin, uh, as you know, the, I like very much your presentation, but it's interesting also to make a comparison with what is going on in the ag agriculture. So farming, uh, marine farming is very recent activity. And uh, where you compare the number of species that we are growing uh, at sea, it's very numerous. We have more than, I don't know, 100, 200 species. Uh, when you compare to what is going on on the agriculture, which is very few. So my question to you is, what will be the next trend? How are we going to continue to diversify? Uh, some people think that the best way to make a profit is to have a large number of, of fish on your plate, so we should continue to breed new species, or would it better to focus on a limited number of model species that we could really develop at a very large scale, like uh, Salmon, so what is your opinion on that? Thank you. May I suggest that uh, we try a first uh, round of uh, answers or replies? Who uh, would like to start? Uh, yeah, yes, uh, well, going back to your question, I, and, and in fact, I, I did say very clearly that what we need is to have a coexistence. And I think what we need is diversity also in the systems, is, is rather than to have just one view of, you know, everything has to be homogeneous and the only way we are going to do solve the, 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 the food problems of the world is if everybody produces maize. Obviously, that's, yeah, I'm doing a caricature. But it's the idea, it's nobody would deny the importance of an industrialized, highly standardized agriculture, but also understand that that model also feeds on having this process going. Right now, we have, uh, we, right now we are benefiting from the historical evolution of this. It's, it's not, this is not free. We are benefiting. It's, it's having the oil, uh, the oil of, of evolution is, is, what is in, in, in what is in gene banks. I mean, that it is the process that has happened over, you know, the 10,000 years of agriculture. The, what we, what I am saying, and, and many of my, in my institution is saying, is that uh, that we shouldn't look at these resources as uh, as uh, as oil, as something that is not renewable. But we need to look at it as renewable resources because this can continue to be renewed. And nobody is advocating that everybody should go back to organic agriculture or, or living uh, with you know one ton of. Nobody is advocating that. I think that is more trying to understand what would be the right mix and balance of, diff of, you know, to what extent maintaining systems and, and certain systems with, with these characteristics can contribute to sustain also the other, the more intensive system. So I think that that's, it's not really a dichotomy, but it's more of a complementarity. And, and that's a challenge. I, I don't think we know the answer to that. Also, uh, you know, so, so this idea of, 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 of the coexistence, diversity of coexistence, we talked, I mean, I am new, I've never been to this uh, bioeconomy, and, and many people, I, I, all, I find very interesting that you, you, we, I keep on hearing biomass as if it's a homogeneous process. I mean, clearly, it's, it's, there is quality of biomass. There are different types of biomass. They have, you know, even when we talk about food, you know, it's not, we need diversity. I mean, this is very clearly stated. I mean, the more and more, and, and I'm not a nutritionist, but we know that a diversified diet is actually very healthy, and that's the way it should be. So clearly, even in a very developed, in, 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 in thinking about the future, we need this type of co create of uh, managing this, co this, this, this idea of, of, of uniformity versus diversity. And finally, there is a lot of talk about profits, but we have to remember that profits are not, ma they are not magical, they are not spiritual. They occur, they don't happen in the void. They are part of, they are part of an institutional context. They occur because we have institutions, and these institutions can shift what makes certain things profitable and certain things unprofitable. So, and this is also a, a social decision and a political decision. So, it, so therefore, it's not just. I mean, the market is 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 an institution, and as such, is 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 operating this, and we need to uh, bring that uh, that that perspective. And and I think if if there is a need to bring this other perspective, and we think that. That diversity is an important part of the sustainability and the and, and the resilience. Now this is the new word that now become more fashionable. But we need the institutions have to adapt to that. And 
and, and, and recognizing that there's always trade-offs. I mean, there's always going to be trade-offs. And then the question is, how do we solve those trade-offs? How do we find the, the right balance? Thank you. And I didn't answer about the benefit sharing, but maybe your colleagues would answer. Uh, I, um, again, I think organic agriculture wasn't at all mentioned in my talk, <laughs> I have to admit, and I think it's not up. The example I um, mentioned from Aarhus University was just, and maybe this didn't come out clear enough from my talk, also with regard to your question with, with grassland. That was very much a, a, a Danish, looking from a Danish situation. And that, I think, in general, should be mentioned. I mean, it has been said so often during uh, today, that uh, during the day, that it is we have to find, and that would also help with landscape biodiversity, from where we are, we have to find our uh, national, regional uh, ways to increase biodiversity, um, develop our ways of producing more biomass. And that was the other point with regard to the 60% you made, what we might need by 2050. Uh, that was, again, it was a way that was also the question, how can we produce more biomass under Danish, under Northern European, under Northern European conditions? And grassland would be one option because it can use um, much longer the, the sun than, for example, wheat. With the um, nitrogen, again, it is, it's not, it, none of this, what the example I brought will not solve all the problems. It is just one step, one possibility to do something about something, a starting point. There will be a lot of other things uh, needed and will be developed along the way. I'm pretty sure we're just at the start of it. We have also made, like I said, with the bioethanol and so on, a lot of mistakes have been made. We have to find our ways. We have to stumble ahead because we don't really know what we can do. We don't really know what the potential in the sea is and how it can be used. So there are so many unknown, so uh, there are no clear answers. There is just, we know that we have to increase for all um, economic, uh, ecological service and so on. We have to build on also for resilience of systems and so on. We have to build on biodiversity. We have to get more biodiversity back in our systems. And um, sort of with regard to the microorganism, I think a lot of people are very much aware that there still can be, there's a lot of work to be done. I don't know. Uh, Myself, but I just know that you're right. Uh, there is also a lot of things which um, which can be explored, um, and I think mainly the EU fish. I leave to you. <laughs> okay, I'm happy with the three questions in this row because uh, I, I see a logic uh, from one to the other. So I start with the first one uh, because that's more the, the most general question. Eh? We we need to produce more food. We need to produce more biomass with all the ambitions that we heard in, in, in this conference. Uh, uh, so that's, that's the case, that's the challenge. But then, how we can cope with this challenge? And the only way to cope is producing more biomass is that we need a vital system that can produce biomass. And there it comes to the connection with biodiversity. Uh, a more vital basis for biomass production is, in general, a more adaptive system and a more efficient system. Yeah, that, these are the two key things. And in a vital ecosystem, adaptation and efficiency is also the two key points. So not only in biomass production for our human consumption or our human needs, but also for, for, for the planet Earth. So these are two friends. And, and that means that if we want to produce two times more biomass, we have to take care of the biodiversity because the biodiversity is the key for adaptation and for efficiency. Uh, and and then, it, then it fits. Then you really can... An ecosystem is not wasting. And if we're producing an agro-ecosystem or a bio-based economy ecosystem, we also have to make it sure that it's not wasting biomass, that it's not wasting energy. And, 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 and that we use the full potential of the biodiversity, of the genetic, uh, genetic uh, capacity and, and all the adaptation capacity that biota have. And then I come to your point. Uh, yeah, we, we have many. It's not only the sea, it's also the grasslands. And, and, and today there is the conference of the Global Agenda of Sustainable Livestock uh, Production in, in, in Colombia. 
And the two keystones there are uh, uh, more valued grassland and, and manure management because these are the two keys to, to, to come to uh, more production with, uh, with livestock. And more value to grassland is strengthening the, uh, the, the, the vitality, the basis of grasslands to produce more. Uh, and, and then you have to protect the biomass because only a mono species grassland is not uh, cannot sustain the highest biomass uh, production that that you can think of also in other marginal uh, lands and and the same with manure it manure is more than only nutrients and energy mind you we have, you have heard this morning you you have to take all out of all valuables out of, of this kind of materials bioenzymes in manure are the ones that I'm interested in much more than in, than in the energy or in the nutrients. Okay, that comes along. And I think this is really the basis to answer that, that, that difficult question, uh, Jacques, about a marine system. Because if you ask me this question, on the first hand, I should say, well, uh, and, and, and about Decker, the, the former CEO of, uh, of Nutreka, was also quite clear in that. We have only uh, four or five species in the world for production of livestock, and we have... Uh, 40, 80 probably uh, for the production of fish. And is that now smart? Is that uh, efficient? I think concentrate and upgrade by, by focusing on certain species with, with genetic improvement, with feed, uh, 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 um, customized feed, etc., etc., like what we do in, in, the, in the livestock production, would be a good way to be more efficient. But are we also more adaptive then? Are we really, can we really create a situation where we produce uh, fish in a way that uh, you can do a lot with them? What do we do with the waste streams of fish? And, and, and in, in, in terrestrial ecosystems, the, 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 the yield cap analysis clearly uh, state that in multi-diverse agro-ecosystems, the production in the final end is higher. The production... Uh, one of our professors, Simke de Boer, says, well, sustainability is the amount of, of, of biomass that you can produce from a hectare of land without, uh, uh, without over-exploiting, without, uh, how you call it, depletion of the, of, of, of the natural resources. And that should also be the, 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 the focal point in, in aqua production. And then I do not mean agro-ecosystem approaches like uh, the ecosystem, agro-ecosystem gurus tell, because that, that, that is not, I, I think that's more, uh, yeah, gut feeling and, 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 and not, 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 not really on the base of, of, of facts and figures. Uh, and and in, in, in aquaculture, we have some such like integrated multi-trophic uh, aquaculture. If we really bring in all the animals together in one system, then we do not need aquaculture, then it's not farming, then it's just like outside, and outside the nature is better than we can, can create. But we have to think of building blocks in a cascade, where, uh, and, and, and for that reason, you ask my recommendation, I hesitate to recommend to only go for the sea bass and the salmon and, uh, and the trout, uh, and the mussel. I think it would be wise to explore the potential of the biodiversity, the marine biodiversity, also from this perspective, biomass perspective. And it comes along with another thing, consumers of seafood appreciate culinary biodiversity. They want that one of the, the, the consumers, uh, um, thing, not, 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 not for all, but, but one of the things are the freedom air. Thank you. Be before opening the floor to more questions and comments, I, I would ask. Uh, I would uh, like to give a comment of my own. I think that we should put different things all in, a, in the same framework. Not talking about, uh, let's say, producing more food or increasing biodiversity or sustainable development, but to consider all the things uh, at the same time. Just an, an example for practical example of what I mean. Uh, we are uh, already uh, using more, much more nitrogen, uh, which of course is produced from uh, making use of fossil fuel to a large extent, much more than the Earth can tolerate. Uh, I think it's a factor of two or two and a half 
of what uh, the the uh, uh, the earth would uh, accept uh, so one imperative is to produce if we want uh, to produce protect the, uh, the climate from further changes we have to reduce uh, nitrogen of course nitrogen uh, as a fertilizer chemical fertilizer of course, the, one of the answers would be to better exploit, understand and exploit uh, soil bacteria, uh, the in, uh, interactions between bacteria and plants. Another one would be to uh, better understand uh, intercropping. Intercropping systems have already been tested, uh, for instance, between even maize and legumes. And legumes as, uh, act as a nit nitrogen uh, fertilizer for the maize or I would say maize, but also uh, tree crops and so on. So I think that uh, with a, if we want really to look at things at, with a longer perspective than just uh, a few years, we would have to put all this consideration on the same. We always talk about a, a holistic approach, but that is exactly what is needed. Uh, we are facing also sh some shortages that we are probably putting aside from our mind, but uh, it is estimated that, for instance, the phosphate production, which is, has no other resources uh, uh, than the uh, known uh, mines of phosphates, will culminate, we have an upper point in production in 2030. To 2030 is tomorrow what we'll do after that. The other sources of phosphate are already uh, contaminated with cadmium, with uranium, so we are not willing to use them. Uh, so we uh, must find alternatives, alternative types of crops, and diverse or ecological int intensification of uh, production systems at all level is probably the only viable uh, solution, the viable option. Um, um, diversification of products of uh, uh, species of varieties has been mentioned. Uh, probably even the, in the breeding uh, sector, in the breeding sector, especially for the uh, big, largest commodities, have focused on uh, genotypes with a low interaction with the environment to cover broad ranges, to give no surprise in the, the different environments. Probably it's time to go for. Uh, varieties with a high genotype environment interaction to uh, select uh, uh, varieties that are adapted to the local uh, uh, situation, local conditions. And that means, at the same time, increasing biodiversity, because uh, adaptive uh, varieties are necessarily different from one another. So probably the uh, what we must think and that is not just uh, uh, going back uh, as has been mentioned it's not going backwards but needs intensive research uh, first class research is uh, how to make the the good choice i mean good for the environment good for society also the convenient choice from an economic point of view uh, and that that is the big question how to make the easy choice, the good choice, the easy choice. Please. Yeah, and thank you. I would very much agree with the need for such a holistic approach um, and also to answer big questions. But I have now uh, three small questions um, uh, for Martin. Um, first, uh, you said... First, you said um, uh, that the marine sector is not connected to the, um, uh, to the bioeconomy or it's a separate uh, thing. Um, now there's the policy that uh, discards should be landed. Uh, is that an opportunity to, um, uh, to bring um, um, uh, fisheries more into the, the bioeconomy? Uh, second question is, um, we had this very interesting speech of uh, Gunther Paul this morning. He claims that uh, in two years' time, stocks, ca fish stocks can be uh, recovered with this bubbling fishing uh, technique. Uh, it's very good news, uh, of course. We can uh, forget all our concerns about uh, overfishing and over-exploitation of the sea. Uh, do you share his opti optimism? 
Uh, if so, uh, I think that would be an excellent uh, chance to uh, to get connected to the to the bioeconomy and um, very good. Uh, my third question um, relates to China and uh, Japan. China is very good in aquaculture. Uh, Japan is very good in um, uh, farming um, uh, seaweeds. Uh, what can we learn from uh, those two countries? If, if the uh, question is connected with the fishery sector, no. So um, probably it's more convenient if we have the reply by Martin straight away. And then... Yeah, I think the, the discard ban and, and the landing of discards is, is a pragmatic opportunity to, uh, to connect uh, the two. But I should say it's, it, it is a pragmatic opportunity. And the discard ban is in the final end meant to, to, to the fish to, to uh, uh, make the fishery uh, avoiding the uh, fishing grounds where they have a lot of discards. Uh, in, the, in the fine land, it's not, not the, the, the logic behind it, the reason for it is not to bring in so much biomass from the sea to the land, but to avoid uh, those spots where you uh, catch a lot of uh, 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 discards. Um, and I should say it's, it's a little bit of yeah, too pragmatic to really bind the uh, bio-based economy, which uh, 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 community, which is is quite clever and smart and and intelligent in in how to organize it in such a way that 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 it is efficient biomass use to the uh, actions at uh, at at sea. So I, I prefer that the bio-based economy community goes to sea rather than the the, the, the fishermen bring biomass to feed the bio-based economy uh, at, at land. Uh, second point is uh, I uh, share uh, the, the view of uh, Contrapaoli that a recovery of stocks can be very rapidly. We have seen that in the, in the North Sea with uh, many of the stocks are recovered to better situations than, than ever before after uh, a couple of uh, 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 mitigation uh, measures. So, yeah, that can be. If, if it can be in two years, I'm, I'm, it depends on the species. And for, for cod, that's not true. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, that was part of the question. The other part is the bubbles. The bubbles are interesting. It's, it's an interesting technology. Bubbles are also being used, for instance, to prevent that uh, sea mammals become disturbed by uh, noise from windmills at sea. So bubbles are indeed interested, an interested technology in, uh, in the sea. But I should say there, it's, it's an option. And let's not uh, uh, focus too much on an option, uh, but let's, uh, let's see how we can think of this kind of ideas that, that, that at an, w with ecosystem management, uh, we can foster the biomass production in such a way that we can harvest it in such a way that it's not necessary to uh, use the fishery technologies to the, which, which, which really is scavenging the, uh, the sea. Last question. Yeah, seaweed, I think, is the most interested uh, part for the, the land-based, bio-based economy to, to have interest in the maritime, uh, to become interested in offshore. Uh, activities because seaweed is uh, is a very good material raw material for the bio based uh, um, uh, economy. It's 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 really uh, uh, you can cascade with it uh, uh, with 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 the different value chains that that we learned this morning. And yeah, in Europe, uh, seaweed cultures are in infancy, and and in Asia they are very well developed. And I also think that, that we, in the cooperation with China, especially China, probably Japan, but especially China, um, uh, our benefit of a cooperation with China in, in research and development is if we put seaweed high on the top of the agenda. And I know that the Chinese uh, Academy of Fishery Sciences uh, is, is, is willing to, to set up a cooperation in, uh, in, in that. So that's... Well, that's one of my recommendations to uh, to DGRTD to uh, uh, put this on the agenda to connect the marine economy to the bio-based economy. Thank you. Please. Okay. Thank you uh, again. <laughs>
Um, well, maybe I should just uh, rephrase my question a little bit um, because basically, you know, I'm, I'm a positive person like everyone else and our organization is so as well and would really like to contribute. So can, and, it, and sorry, Mr. Scholzen, but it's not so much about the marine environment. We are moving there, but we are not that, it's not our key business yet. But for the two first speakers, I mean, it's still not clear to me how we move that way. Should we just sit down and wait for 10 to 20 years until science uh, comes up with some new ideas or solutions? Or secondly, should we find a business case that can actually work now? And if we need to find that business case, then it's, it's, quite, it's relatively easy to say, well, it's a, poli it's, it's a policy, cho policy choice. The politicians can just decide that we should do that or that or that. Yeah, but there are people maybe not in this group, but in another group at another conference in another part of the world, dealing with health issues. And they're saying the same. And there's only one cake that you can take from. So basically, I'm still circulating a little bit about the business case, because I think that the food industry and the farmers would like to produce whatever the consumers want, or whatever the regulators, politicians are telling them to do if they are paid for it. So maybe you can come up with some ideas uh, on, on how that business case can be established here and now, because else it seems a little bit a theoretical discussion to me. Thank you. Yeah, Michael Carlos again. Uh, I have two questions and uh, one comment. The first question is, um, it's a great opportunity to have three or four biodiversity experts in a room. We are discussing in many committees, also in SCAR, uh, a question, what is better for biodiversity? If you on the one hand have a very intensive agriculture with a big pressure on land, high yields, and a lot of very strict protected natural areas, this is one opportunity. The other is to have more extensive agriculture, uh, which needs more land because it's not not so high not so high yield related, uh, and uh, even like organic farming, we have some examples in Africa where you can even increase the organic farming the yields by times five or more. So, if you do the one hand intensive or extensive strict protection, less protection areas, what is better better for biodiversity? This is a big question. Perhaps I can get some new input today. The second question is uh, marine biomass. I can, I can of course, imagine when I, when I really go to far future that we're using perhaps almost all part of the ocean for um, macroalgae production, for example. Yeah? That is possible. Is there any calculation how much biomass we could uh, get from from uh, when we're using most of the ocean for, for um, algae farming compared to the uh, biomass we are um, extracting on the, on the soil. Now that would be very interesting for me. These are the two questions and the comment is um, when we talk about biomass supply, uh, we also should talk about biomass demand. Um, for example, the biomass we are using today for non-food applications uh, which is, is about 20-25% um, of whole biomass extraction. Uh, there's a big difference whether we use this mainly for energy and fuel or we say we, can, we are only allowed to use biomass for energy and fuel after one, two, three cascading uses in material and chemicals. This is a big difference in demand. So I think we should always also keep this demand side. Or when I talked about meat consumption, so we can also do a lot on the demand side. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Paola Reale. I'm uh, working for the Bioeconomy Observatory. And um, actually, I have a comment more than um, a question. And it's uh, related to wh what Michael just said. Um, so since the Bioeconomy strategy started, um, actually, uh, they have I mean, I have seen a, a lot of interest by the industries on quantifying ma biomass. But actually, um, if we are where we are, it's because we have an environmental issue. And um, what I said just now, because I'm working for the Bioeconomy Observatory and we're trying to collect biomass at all levels in all 
areas. Um, I suggest that uh, the first sh step should be to collect exhaustive data in marine and environment in general, more in general, uh, to be able to move toward innovation. So the, the, the concrete step it will be to collect data on what we have in biomass at marine level. Um, because in this way, we, we can have a good basis to analyze and enhance research in this area and uh, also to fill in the gaps through a, a right uh, decision from policymakers. So with data as a basis to grow toward bioeconomy. Thank you. Uh, I would say we, we take a, uh, take a, uh, the last questions uh, if there are no more <coughs> raised hands and then we have the final two yeah that that's w will be the last and then we have a final tour of replies because we are running out of time thank you uh, my name is Jean Philippe Orambo I work for the European Commission the GRC uh, my question is in regards to this uh, evolutionary um, insurance policy. I guess in order to get some positive results, we need a minimum, let's say, carrying capacity or surfaces. Do you have any idea of how big, how many surfaces, how, how many locations you would need to kind of set aside and let this evolutionary process happen to create, a, uh, to buy enough ticket to get a good chance of winning? Last question. My name is uh, Geir Oddsson, and I'm coming from the Nordic Council of Ministers in Copenhagen, where I'm responsible for the marine environment uh, as a policy area in the, in the Nordic countries. Uh, I, of course, support uh, putting the blue uh, blue pie economy also on the agenda. I think it is happening very much. Uh, we do have blue growth in in. As a, as a high priority area within, within the European Union, with uh, FAO and in other places. I, I want to put a, a, a proposition uh, which goes beyond uh, utilizing underutilized uh, uh, biomass in the oceans. And I want to po point uh, towards the observatory. There is very good information about the biomass in the oceans that exists. Um, we have a, a, a really big organizations like ISIS that doesn't do anything else. Uh, about 4,000 scientists that uh, work all year uh, collecting data on, on ocean uh, ecosystems. But besides new opportunities, we also have an obligation to utilize what we harvest much better. Uh, I don't know if you real, realize what the waste is in so, so the usual fisheries. Uh, of the cod that comes out of the ocean, much less than half is utilized. The rest is waste, usually thrown back into the ocean, which of course can have e ecosystem benefits in itself, but it is not creating the value that, that or, or, or utilizing the potential for creating value in in bioeconomy value chains. It is possible, and there exist uh, 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 already uh, commercial operations where you utilize 100% of the cod. We have that in Iceland, Faroe, Iceland, uh, Faroe Islands, uh, Norway. Uh, this is phenomenal. I, I, I have a hard time, as uh, working for a policy agency, understanding why industry is not interested in creating value from, from, from the, the resource streams that they, they already catch, they already harvest. Uh, and I would be interested to hear, hear from the industry why it is not happening much more rapidly. So, so this is, uh, you know, on one half about utilizing underutilized species uh, and biomass like uh, algae, and on the other hand, utilizing much better what we have and thereby uh, being capable of, of, of getting more from less, if you, if you will. Thank you very much. Uh, I would now uh, give the floor to uh, okay. Martin for, uh, I, I think that the most uh, 
press, uh, pressing question was about business. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, I don't know whether there are uh, answers yet. Well, no, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it goes back. Taken. It goes back to the question of, of, you know, private versus public goods. You know, businesses work when it's private, private goods. When you and many of the things we are talking about are more public goods, and this is where the problem comes. You know, this this dilemma between the public and the private. And 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 again, I I think it's a, the question is very good, but I, I don't think we have reflected enough. To what would be, and that's what I go back to the institutional issues. What would be the institutional uh, modifications that would be required in order to create an environment in which sort of this, that will be conducive to create the public, the private goods, or, or make it private in such a way that, that there's a business case? I think that there has to be some um, institutional changes that would require making a business case. So this, it cannot be done on itself. I, that's why, I mean, and again, it's not trying to bring a status, a status view of the state trying to create, but recognizing that many of these uh, values are a combination of public and private uh, benefits and goods. And therefore, if we want to make a business case for it, there, there are, we will need to be able to to create an institutional environment in which the, some of the, I mean, when you say privatize sounds so so difficult, but but in a way you are privatizing. And that goes back to the question of access and benefit sharing. You know, how do you, you know, privatize, but in a way that is fair. I mean, that's at the end of the world, I don't think the problem is privatization per se, but it's the perception of fairness. And, and now we know that perception of fairness is wiring into our, into our C DNA almost. So, it's, it, so I don't think it's a problem of private and public per se. Well, it is, but, but it's also a question of fairness. And this goes back to your question, if I might say, the, the question on, on the configuration of, you know, we don't know the answer. I, I think that is, in fact, one of the most, uh, most interesting research questions that we have. What is the functional relationship between, the, say, the diversity that we manage, the, the, the species, that, and that evolutionary potential that can be used in the future, and what should be the right configuration? I don't think we, we do have the answer to that, and, and it, it would, but I, I, to me, this is one of the most interesting uh, research questions, and, and it's, it's, it's still a very open, and, and I don't, you know, I said I don't know the answer, but this is an excellent question. But it relates both to the question, if, if we're gonna make a business case, it's also about these configurations. It's, it's, it's all about configurations and the mixture of the public versus the private, and what is the institutional, uh, what is the institutional framework in which this happens, as, as we all know. Thank you. Um. Yes, I, um, I also agree very much, and I think um, it is difficult, but I also think we are in the transition period, and maybe things are there to come. I mean, changes only happen if they really have to happen, especially when we're looking at very, very sort of cemented structures um, which actually lock us in certain systems. We can't really get out even if we want to because uh, all sorts of structures, regulations, and, and, and things are sort of keep us where we are. I think with what we've heard today that there are challenges, and I think also the change is happening. Um, that it can't be really quantified yet is a, quite a different matter, and it will also, I don't think that there ever will be some, some fixed term, but with regard to um, biodiversity, actually I had a, quite an interesting um, experience this year when I went to holiday in northeastern Poland. And in Poland, after the f change of the, the fall of the wall and so on, still, when I got it right, 25% of the agricultural land, because all of these uh, problems with who belongs to what, and al also that there, sometimes, especially in this region, because there hasn't been so much private agriculture, also under the, the Soviet system, people actually have lost the cap capacity sort of to, to, to have their own farm, sort of they have lost knowledge. That was one of the big problems, but anyhow, 25% of the uh, land is not used. And we walked over a field, a marginal field, a very dry sort of type of field, so it, it, wasn't, it wasn't a very fertile field. And I was there really, Bashatan, I'm used to all this talk about biodiversity but I've never in my life seen so many different butterflies. So I have really seen what loss of biodiversity means. 
So and it was really some kind of an aha sort of thing. Oh my God, that's what we are talking about. And I don't think because we can't really take things out of production, this is not a way to go. But so I think, and that's why I actually use this example from our university, we have to find within our systems, we are under all these pressures to produce and do and grow and create jobs. And I don't know what, sort of try to build in possibilities for at least a higher biodiversity. And this is a learning process, I suppose. So then this is more or less I had to say. Uh, yeah. A couple of uh, uh, questions. The first question was, uh, what is the production potential? The conversion of sunlight into biomass is twice as high in sea compared to land. Why? Because in the sea we have another dimension and, and you have the, uh, the green algae above and the red algae deeper down. So they pick up another part of the spectrum of light. So the full spectrum of sunlight is, is being picked up. And the second one is there is a continuous supply of phosphorus. So there's no local depletion of phosphorus, uh, which which is so it's twice as high. How, how many then? Then there is no 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 ocean full of seaweed needed. Yeah, that, for and I, I know the best for from animal uh, livestock production, uh, the, the feed production. Now the animal production uses uh, 1.6 giga hectares of of land to to feed the livestock all over the world. And that should mean that you have less than one giga hectare of ocean to feed the livestock all over the world. And uh, that sounds, uh, in, in, in perspective, that, that's different from land use. Uh, the second question is, I really, I really like the point of data collection. Uh, when it comes to marine resource management, the data collection is about stock take, uh, assessing the, the stocks. The stocks that being exploited, without with, without regarding the rest of the ecosystem. Whereas when you want to change to a biomass production based on ecosystem production management, marine production management, it is required to come up to another data collection system about uh, uh, environment. Well, I've learned that in the new commission, uh, the marine environment and the marine fisheries and all, is, is, it becomes the responsibility of, of, of one commissioner. So probably uh, we will now finally come out with the data collection system, which is in support of uh, an ecosystem-based approach of marine production management rather than a single stock-based uh, uh, approach. Uh, the third point about uh, the residuals, uh, upgrading of residuals, yeah, I, I, I can comment a lot about that, but I, I fully agree with you that uh, it, 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 in, in livestock you see it more and more in the, in the fuel uh, production in Europe, almost 100% of the fields is being used. I've, I was in a herring factory in Iceland uh, one and a half month ago, 100% of the herring is being used. I really like this this kind of things. Zero waste this is, is is really there in uh, in, in in practice, and and, and seafood based materials can uh, can be used in uh, in that perspective. And I, I want to make one final comment on, on just on, on on the thinking, which it's not for you, but yeah, I, I think we. We have to have a mind shift. We have to come out of a dogma. And the dogma is that more intensive production leads to loss of biodiversity. In the past, it was so. Yeah, and, and it can be so. But if you do it in another way, you can improve production at a certain hectare. It's not no need to extensify. You, 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 you can intensify. Uh, but if, if, if your uh, guideline is zero loss of biodiversity, uh, then, then you have to come up with other management options to sustain uh, an, an intensive production. It's, it's like what you say, a zero use of antibiotics in livestock. And it can be done, it requires a mind, it requires another approach. But this requires a mind shift from both the animal production sector, as well as from the nature conservation sector. Nature conservation should be become natural exploitation and, and, and looking forward how we can recover nature. And by recovering nature, 
also re uh, uh, improving the, the potential for biomass production. And, and I think the alliances and some NGOs understand that this is the way to, to build up the alliances. Uh, I, I think that's the, that's the future. Nature conservation as such will not help. So, uh, thank you very much, all of you. Uh, I just try to, uh, not to summarize, but to fix some of the main points I've uh, noted down. Um, there are, first of all, some preconditions for the preservation and improvement of the biodiversity capital. First of all is uh, that benefits must, must be shared. Uh, the second one is that we must better understand the ecosystems and the evolutionary processes. Uh, third condition is that we have to keep the different scales of uh, biodiversity in mind. We, of course, we still face some risks. Uh, some are unavoidable, at least in the uh, short term such a climate change or uh, market demands that are not really predictable. Uh, another risk is that uh, uh, what has appeared in one of the uh, papers that uh, uh, Martin presented, the, the tragedy of the commons, that uh, the, the common goods are perceived as no one's good instead of everyone's good. And so uh, biodiversity should be perceived as everyone's richness, everyone's uh, right to be preserved. Uh, we, um, we have many opportunities from bioeconomy. Uh, the first is uh, the cascading concept. I mean, uh, making the best use of what is available. We also uh, have had an opportunity to, in one of the two round tables, that, the concurrent round tables this morning, about the use of, of uh, different products contained in uh, uh, wheat brain. That, that is exactly what is needed. I mean, uh, uh, taking the uh, ad more added value products first and then uh, uh, exploiting all the, uh, the, the, the different uh, byproducts. So uh, multiple use Cascading and multiple use means also uh, resilience from an economic point of view. Because we, if we have multiple uh, uses of the same good, uh, there is no, ju no, just, no, no one uh, single use that uh, uh, can fail and destroy all the systems. So that means also resilience. And... Um, what actions to be made? Of course, we mentioned already uh, better understanding of ecosystems. Uh, we must uh, develop uh, uh, to a, a more extensive, extensive degree and more intensive degree uh, what is the concept of ecological intensification of agriculture. We need to produce more food, more feed, probably more food and less feed in the, in the future in order to be able to nourish uh, the 9.2 billion people in 2050. We have still uh, options. We do not have to take uh, what are current trends as given facts. I agree with Martin, uh, uh, Michael Carlos, that uh, probably also a change of diets toward uh, more uh, vegetable protein uh, oriented uh, uh, diet would be more sustainable and prob probably also a possibility in the future. Um, we also have to fill the yield gaps. There are, even in the best uh, um, agricultural systems, let's say from best from the uh, environmental point of view, uh, let's say uh, either organic or similar sort of uh, uh, um, production systems, there is still a huge gap between the most performing uh, models and what and the, the worst. I think if we can learn from experience and adopt the best models uh, and the best practices, 
that would uh, in, uh, also help fill the gap in productivity. Um, we, uh, the, the final message for me that I have very little knowledge about the seas and the fish is that uh, uh, probably the next frontier will be the marine ecosystems, not only because of the uh, huge surface it covers, but also because it is, it starts from behind. I mean, it, it's still in its infancy, if we uh, may say so. Uh, fisheries, uh, now, well, now we have aqu aqu uh, aquaculture, but uh, before aquaculture, it was still what agriculture, no, what mankind was before the invention of agriculture. So a sort of hunting, gathering uh, approach. Is still both as me that we are eating uh, to a large extent carnivorous species instead of herbivorous species as we do. We would not never dream of eating carnivorous species in, uh, in with the animals uh, grow um, on, on land with livestock. Uh, so probably either we shift to different species or we find a sustainable way to feed the the. Um, fish in, agri in uh, at least in aquaculture. So uh, I think we probably have no uh, given no uh, answers for to the big questions. Uh, what can be done now to uh, exploit biodiversity, to protect biodiversity without uh, ex exploiting the capital in a positive way, and not in a negative way. But uh, I think that uh, by joining the knowledge and uh, by combining the uh, approaches uh, that of different disciplines, of different fields of knowledge, the future is there. I mean, the, there are great opportunities that must be explored, and the uh, only possibility is to do that in an interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary way breaking the boundaries between disciplines, uh, breaking the uh, silos of knowledge. That has already been incorporated into the concept of the Horizon 2020 strategies. It's still probably not perceived well enough in the academic institutions. That we is probably the, the next uh, big effort that we shall have to, to do all together. So thank you very much again and uh, uh, have a nice uh, evening and uh, a fruitful conference for the rest of your time. Thank you. Yes, yes, I'm me too. Oh, yeah.